damn it, I can talk, I can talk, I can talk until I'm looking at that camera lens. Good evening, guys, and welcome back to the Suburban Proletarian. My name is Greg, and if this shot looks like it's framed a little bit weird, a little bit cramped, and I look like I'm leaning forward a bit uncomfortably, it's because my microphone cable is stretched tighter than a banjo string. I ran into the same problem in the last episode, and I tried to remedy it by ordering a, an extension cable from Amazon.com, but Lord Bezos, in his inimitable style, has screwed me once again. I tried using that extension cable today, and I couldn't get it to work, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But, as it turns out, the microphone extension cable, which they sent me, which was advertised as a microphone extension cable, is in fact a headphone extension cable. It doesn't work with microphones, so we're pretty much stuck with the setup we have right now. But the show must go on, and we're going to soldier on, short microphone cable and all, and uh, hopefully by the next episode, things will be a little bit different. So anyway, today's episode is going to be the first installment of a series I'm producing in which I examine different countries and different economic systems' efforts to produce the most egalitarian of timepieces. These are blue-collar watches for working-class people who just need to keep their lives on schedule. So today we're going to be taking a look at a trio of auto-winding mechanical watches from Japan. This will include an example of the Citizen Eagle 7, an example of the Orient TriStar, and, of course, the most ubiquitous of all Japanese mechanicals, the Seiko 5. But, before we move on to the tabletop, let's do the customary wristwatch check. In keeping with today's theme, I'm wearing what probably is the most proletarian of all Japanese watches, the Casio F91W. I don't really know what I could say about this watch that hasn't been said here and other places a million times, other than there's probably been more of them manufactured than all other digital watches combined. And if you eliminate just a few mechanical watches from makers like Seiko and Citizen and Hindustan Machine Tool in India, it's probably the best-selling watch ever in the history of the world. So, it's got that going for it. It's not very glamorous, but it is iconic. I know people hate that word, but it's true. It's iconic. Anyway, let's get on with it. All right, guys, so here they are. We've got the Citizen Eagle 7. We've got an Orient TriStar. And, of course, the watch with which we are all so familiar already, the Seiko 5. Now, keep in mind, this is not intended to be an in-depth review of any one of these watches. I, this is the third time I'm filming this tabletop segment. The first time turned into a 28-minute ramble that nobody was going to want to watch. Uh, I tried to blow through it the second time, and I looked down at the timer, and it said 24 minutes. So I realized now I really really have to skim. Um, so each of these is really only meant to represent an entire series of watches from each manufacturer. Uh, they do all share a similar design concept. They were all aimed squarely at the same market segment. Um, these were primarily intended for the Asian market and other parts of the developing world. But certainly the Seiko 5, which is still in production, um, was available in Western Europe and North America, at least to a limited extent. And um, the Orient uh, TriStar is also uh, still in production and was available in Europe and North America. And I believe uh, the Citizen Eagle 7 was to a certain extent. Um, they were all primarily conceived as rugged timepieces that could withstand a considerable amount of abuse and neglect. Uh, as I stated before, all three are auto-winding mechanicals that can go a long time between servicings. So I'm not really going to go over the history too terribly much, not too in-depth here. Um, but we will start with the Seiko 5, since that is sort of the granddaddy of the genre. The... Uh, progenitor of um, this entire class of wristwatches. So, as we all know, 
the Seiko 5 can be identified by this 5 and a shield uh, on the dial. Um, and most of us also know that the 5 stands for 5 design principles as laid out by Seiko when the watch was introduced. One is automatic winding. It's an automatic winding watch. Uh, two is day and date displayed in a single window. This uh, mid-1980s example still has the day and date in a single window. And as you can see here, the day on this particular watch, the day wheel is marked not only in English names, but also Japanese kanji characters for days of the week. Um, the third principle was water resistance. Um, I think that was originally laid out at uh, 30 meters, but the, certainly there have been uh, limited numbers of Seiko 5s that have had higher water resistance. This one's not marked, so I'll just assume that it's 30 meters. Um, a recessed crown at the 4 o'clock position, and this one does indeed have a recessed crown at the 4 o'clock position. Um, keeping the crown pushed into the case here obviates the need for uh, traditional crown guards. Uh, it protects the crown from getting bent or uh, knocked out of alignment. And the fifth design principle was a durable case and bracelet. Now this watch has clearly seen a fair amount of usage. It's plenty scratched up. It's been around for a long time. It's still running. So I would say it had a pretty durable case and bracelet. Uh, I think it's lived up pretty much to the standards set forth in 1963 when the Seiko 5 was introduced. Uh, materials, it's stainless. The case is stainless. It has a stainless steel screw-down case back. It has a stainless bracelet, stainless deployment clasp, pretty much everything on this watch that isn't uh, acrylic. The crystal on this one is acrylic, unlike the other two watches which have glass crystals. Um, pretty much everything else you can see on the outside of the watch is stainless steel. The workmanship, uh, boy, it's pretty nice. When you hear the horror stories today of even more expensive uh, Seiko watches with misaligned chapter rings and everything, this thing is a real work of art. It's uh, really, despite its sort of rough, rough condition, um, it was beautifully manufactured. I can't see any obvious uh, manufacturing defects in it. Um, now the movement in this is a little bit different than uh, what we're used to today. The current series of Seiko 5s have uh, Seiko's excuse me, 7S26 movement, which is a 21 joule automatic. This has an earlier movement. This one has the... Um, we can see here the 7009, which is a 17 joule movement, but it is the movement from which the 7S26 was derived. So it's in the same family. Um, as I said, it's a 17 joules. Um, no real complications to speak of other than day and date standard uh, three hand uh, analog watch. Um, accuracy, it seems to be pretty good. I haven't had this watch a real long time. I haven't had a chance to run it against Watch Check app, but um, so far it seems to be keeping pretty decent time. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward, conservative sport watch. You could pretty much wear this anywhere except, uh, you know, a really formal function. It'd be pretty much at home anywhere from camping to uh, the office. Uh, conservative appearance. Originality, it's not the most original thing in the world. The Japanese have always been good at, at uh, co-opting other people's designs. The overall shape of the case, the brushed stainless finish, certainly the, uh, the design of the bracelet, and even, um, let's see if we can see it, this italic font for automatic here. All of those things are clearly derivative of one design I can think of, and that's the early uh, Rolex Air King. So, I'm not saying it's a copy or even an homage, but they definitely borrowed heavily from that design. And I think they did it in a nice, uh, in a very nice way. It's an attractive watch, and um, if it was made today, I, I wouldn't 
you know, turn up my nose at it. It doesn't scream 1980s to me. Uh, all right, we're at seven minutes. Let's move on. We'll move on, actually, to the Citizen Eagle 7. Very similar watch in a lot of ways. Um, now, these watches came out uh, quite a few years after the Seiko 5. Um, I believe this, the, the Eagle 7 or the 7 series, it was originally just called the 7, and I don't know if you'll be able to see very well, but there is a 7, very similar font style to the 5, and it's in a shield, which is very similar to the 5 on the Seiko. And I have a feeling, this is just a hunch, that at some point in time, maybe there was talk of litigation or something, and the Citizen 7 series became the Citizen Eagle 7 series. And they simply took that 7 and shield and put it on the breast of an eagle, uh, I guess to differentiate themselves a little bit. Um, I don't know that that's true, but it's, it seems plausible to me. Because the original 7s were just a 7 and a shield. Why they chose 7, I have no idea. Um, there could have been 7 design principles, much as there was with Seiko. But, um, I don't know. Uh, 7 is a prime number that has uh, mystical and spiritual connotations in many cultures. So maybe they just picked 7 because it was bigger than 5. Who knows? Um... Very similar in functionality. This one also has a day and date in the same window. And as you can see, this one has its days in English and Arabic, interestingly enough. I don't know. Maybe this watch started life in uh, the Middle East. Uh, I really could not say. Uh, materials. Now, this is a little bit... This is probably the... Kind of, I don't want to cast aspersions, because it's a pretty decent watch, but it's kind of the cheesiest of these three, because uh, it's the only one that's not all stainless. Um, it does have a mineral uh, glass crystal, and it does have a stainless steel case back and gold-plated stainless steel bracelet, but this case is not stainless. It is brass, uh, gold-plated brass. Um, but that was not the cardinal sin several decades ago. This, this watch is probably mid-1980s, much like the Seiko 5. And a couple of decades ago, that was not the, the, the cardinal sin that it is today. A lot of decent quality watches came with brass cases. And this is, in fact, a decent quality watch with a brass case. Now, this watch has the Citizen's 8200 movement, which came out in 1975, about the same time that the Citizen 7 was introduced. The 8200 movement started life as a 21-joule movement and is still a 21-joule movement. It's still being produced today. Um, still being used in some of Citizen's uh, mechanical dive watches, uh, if I'm correct. So, the movement in this watch has outlived the movements in either of these watches has been in service longer than the movements in either of these two watches. Uh, the 8200 is a real workhorse and um, one thing that's interesting about the Citizen 8200 it is an auto winding mechanical like these other two but it also has the capability to be hand wound. Uh, it's not hacking but it is hand winding. Um, design, it's a little bit flashier than the other two, a little bit less of a sports watch, and as far as originality and influences, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, I'm sure if you talk to Citizen about it, they would uh, claim that it was pure coincidence, but the Jubilee bracelet, the fluted bezel, I mean, come on guys, I'm not even gonna, not even gonna go there. We're at 11 minutes. Boy, this thing doesn't like to autofocus. There we go. And so lastly, but not leastly, the Orient TriStar. Now, I've had this particular model uh, for about five years now. Um, 
The Orient uh, TriStar, again, I'm not sure that's an official name, kind of like the Eagle 7. Uh, it's oftentimes referred to as the TriStar because of these three stars on the dial. Um, I've also seen it referred to as the Orient 3 star. Um, it's also an auto winding. Oh, it, well, let's do construction first. It is all stainless. This one, most Orient TriStars are 30 meters, but this one's 50 meters of water resistance. It is all stainless. Although it has a press on back, the other two watches have screw down oyster type case backs. Uh, and it was originally all stainless steel. It came on a stainless bracelet as well. Although I'm not really a big fan of rectangular watches on bracelets. So I've replaced it with this very cheap $8 leather strap from Walmart. Um, Pretty straightforward, three-hand uh, analog like the other two. Um, it also has day and date, but not in the same window. As you can see here, there are multiple day windows. And the day wheel, in this case, illuminates or uh, changes the color of individual day windows as the dates of the week progress. Either red or navy blue. I have it set to red right now. And um, interestingly, it moves in a counterclockwise direction. I'm not sure if the wheel is moving in a counterclockwise direction, but the hands go around, uh, the uh, uh, days travel all around the dial in a counterclockwise direction. Um, the movement, it is uh, a 20, this is a 21 joule um, auto winding mechanical. Um, it started life as a 17 joule auto winding mechanical. And uh, Orient calls it the 469 movement. Uh, the previous 17-joule movement was also the 469. Uh, but originally it started life as a uh, Seiko movement, the Seiko 7005. So it would have been in the same family as the 7009 in uh, the Seiko 5 here. Very similar movements. Um, appearance, I think it's a good looking watch. Um, originality, it's certainly the most original of the three watches. I don't see any really clear design uh, influences on this watch. Let me wipe off the fingerprints. I didn't wear my white gloves because I don't like looking like a pretentious dick. But then you end up with uh, fingerprints. Um, other than the fact that it's rectangular and there are some uh, really uh, famous watches that are rectangular, like the uh, the Cartier Tank and the uh, uh, the Jaeger La Coltra uh, Reverso, um, but there's really no resemblance here. I think it's an attractive watch with the uh, the brushed um, finish on the dial. That's uh, you know it's brushed radially on the sides and uh, vertically in the center to give this sort of I don't know, almost three-dimensional appearance. It's a nice-looking watch and, and very original. It doesn't get a lot of comments. It doesn't really... Um, it doesn't get a lot of comments and compliments. It doesn't really jump out at people. But I think it's a nice, handsome watch. So maybe a little bit dressier than the other two uh, and a little less flashy. Uh, but the Orient... Uh, and I don't have a photograph of this movement because, as I said, I've had this movement. I've had this watch since it was brand new. It's never been serviced, and um, I didn't want to take the case back off of it just to take a picture of the movement. But I think you can be sure that the movement is actually very similar to the seven thousand and nine that's in the Seiko Five. Um, so I think that pretty much covers it. We're at 16 minutes, which is already long. It seems like I have really skimmed this and not covered much, but, um, uh, I promise that I will, if anyone's interested, and maybe even if they're not, I will, um, do more in-depth review of each of these watches, uh, with the possible exception of the, uh, Eagle 7. I'm not sure I'm going to hold on to this, um, but at any rate... That's my quick thoughts on these three watches. And with that, let's uh, head back over to the bookshelves. All right, guys. So well, I think that pretty much wraps up the first installment of our 
I guess we'll call it the Proletarian Watches of the World series. I can't believe I managed to pare that tabletop down. It looks like I'll be able to edit it down to about 15 minutes or so. And you have no idea what a Herculean effort that was for me. I really feel like I only touched on about half of the points I wanted to cover. And again, I'll be producing a longer, more comprehensive video review of each of those watches in the future. In addition to that, I've got a couple more episodes coming up in this series. One where we compare true proletarian watches, one from East Germany, one from Red China, one from the Soviet Union, and another episode on the ubiquitous Casio F91W and its brethren. So if you've enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it, please take the fraction of a second required to click the like button down below. If you'd like to see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. You can always unsubscribe if you decide you don't like the channel in the future. And if you're already a subscriber and you want to see more content, go ahead and click that little bell icon. What that'll do is get YouTube to send you notifications when I upload new content to the channel. So I guess that pretty much wraps it up. I hope to see all of you here again next time.